The name of the show is opening soon at a theater near you. Two critics talking about and sometimes arguing about the new movies in town. This is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic for the Chicago Tribune and CBS TV News in Chicago. We're going to be taking a look at a lot of the new Christmas movies, the holiday blockbusters that have come along just in time to save what's been a fairly mediocre movie year. We'll see film clips from King Kong, Network, Rocky, and five other movies. And Gene, I believe a star has been born again. You're right. Roger, the basic Stars Born story is about a couple of show business types who are in love, but their love is busted apart when one career zooms while the other plummets. The newest version stars Barbara Streisand and Chris Christofferson as, naturally, a couple of pop singers. He's on the way down with a drug and booze problem, and she's just getting started with her career when he takes her to his home and spontaneously puts a lyric to her music. should come as no surprise that these two people are much more interesting when they're singing than when they're acting out a melodrama. In fact, a couple of times I actually closed my eyes during the picture while Streisand was singing because I didn't want to have her latest funny lady character interfere with her beautiful voice. To be truthful, I did enjoy some of the film. It certainly did make show business appear awfully boring, which is a lot more interesting than the old cliche that show business is glamorous. But I'm not so sure that was intentional. A picture like this is fairly easy to judge. It comes down to whether you care if this couple lives happily ever after or not. I sure didn't, but I certainly enjoyed hearing Barbara Streisand sing that she did. Roger? I did too, Gene. I think she has a great voice, but I thought it was very strange in this movie, since it was a contemporary movie, that she didn't look contemporary. The clothes that she wore came out of her own closet, according to the credits, but I think she picked the wrong one. She should have had a few Levi's for the desert. And I think we can blame her producer and hairdresser, John Peters, for the fact that, again, this time she looks more like Harpo Marx than she really should. Well, you know, th this woman, we've heard so much about her that it's very difficult, I think, for any one of, any one of us to believe any more that she is an ingenue and a fresh up-and-coming singer. I think that filmmakers have to deal with the reality that this is one of the most publicized women in America and that the audience is going to carry with that with them into the theater. And so I don't believe Streisand when she plays innocent as she does quite often in that scene that we actually saw. Still, at the end of the film, as I think you'll agree, her long, uh, long take, seven or eight, nine minutes of singing is just sensational. She's a great star. And speaking of Streisand, Jean, I heard a story when I was out in Los Angeles recently that may or may not be true, but who cares? It seems that Streisand also wanted to be in King Kong. And when Dino De Laurentiis heard that, he said, it's a no good idea have a two monsters in one movie. <laughs> so Dino went ahead and made King Kong without her, and he spent more than $24 million on his epic. The surprising thing is, he got his money's worth. The movie's special effects are convincing, the story is a nice, satisfactory adventure, and the new King Kong is a worthy heir to the family name. Here we see him about to have his first appearance.
That was newcomer Jessica Lang we saw there, and her screams can be roughly translated as, Take your hands off me, you great big ape. She and the other human actors in the movie, Jeff Bridges and Charles Grodin, play it pretty straight, with lots of grim expressions, terse comments, frenzied screams, declarations of love, and all the other staples of classic monster movies. King Kong works pretty well on a simple and silly level. It may not be art, but it's good entertainment. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I found that the picture for me was always interrupting itself this way, that it would kid around a lot and make some jokes about itself, about the monster, about the characters, and then it would try and get serious again in establishing Kong's power. And I found that those two forces kept playing off negatively against each other, and the picture was sort of always trying to get back its momentum and lost something. I will agree with you on one point. I thought Jessica Lange was very good in the film and creates a lot of interest. In fact, I found her much more interesting than Kong because I didn't buy all of the special effects. Gene, I must admit that I found Jessica Lange more interesting than Kong myself, <laughs> and especially Jessica Lange's special effects. Well, there's a good new Sherlock Holmes movie out. It's called The 7% Solution. But if you go, don't expect to see the same old suave sleuth of Baker Street that Basil Rathbone used to play. This Sherlock Holmes has a problem with cocaine addiction, which, at the very beginning of the movie, has him creeping around his house like a paranoid bull goose loony. And because Holmes is always freaking out, Dr. Watson conspires to take Holmes to Vienna and have him cured by a famous doctor. Freud's the name, head shrinking is his game, and before long, these two brilliant men, Holmes and Freud, are working together on the same kidnapping case. So scared. You will empty your pockets. Give all the cocaine you've brought to Dr. Watson. Watson. Now, I will make a series of statements, and you will agree or disagree, depending on the accuracy. Is that understood? Say yes. Yes. The battle. I see everything. The whole thing turns on two psychological points. The balance compulsive of gambling and the Amon Pasha's fascination for red-headed women. Bravo, Doctor. And your powers of observation and inference would make you a great detective. The Baron is a compulsive gambler. <laughs> he lost a fortune this season at Monte Carlo. <laughs> the Amon Pasha bought up all his outstanding notes in order to control him completely. Really, Doctor, you positively scintillate. What next? He offered to tear up the notes in exchange for Fräulein Devereaux. Whom he wished to add to his seraglio. <laughs> his harem. <laughs> the Baron agreed and hired you to abduct his mistress. <laughs> Knowing of her former narcotic addiction, you were instructed to revive it in order to render her pliant and dependent. <laughs> ah. So much for the psychological point of view. It's the next series of steps that confuse me. Well, if you will permit me, perhaps I can explain them to you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> All that is necessary is to combine your methods and my own. I am all attention. That was Nicole Williamson as Holmes, Alan Arkin as Freud, and the funny little guy was Joel Gray. Vanessa Redgrave is the kidnapped lady, and Sir Lawrence Olivier plays the decrepit Professor Moriarty in this picture, Holmes' arch enemy. Obviously, that's an all-star cast, and the film is witty and a stylish comedy. Some Sherlock Holmes purists have been knocking this picture, saying it makes fun of Holmes. I disagree. I think it's a classy movie that, in a curious way, gives the totally fictitious character of Holmes an elementary, yet comic touch of reality. I agree, Gene, although I don't want to agree with you too much, I agree this time. I was thinking of the Billy Wilder movie, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, a few years ago, which was quite heavy-handed. I like the nice little touches in this one, as when Freud, for example, says to Holmes, uh, elementary, my dear uh, fellow. You know, we don't get very many witty pictures, and this one is it for the year we had that uh, one with sean connery uh winning the line with a little bit of wit man would be king not many though clint eastwood is the nation's number one action star and he's never been more popular than when he plays dirty harry a san francisco cop who believes in taking the law onto his own hands in dirty harry's newest film the enforcer eastwood has a woman cop for a partner and she's played by tyne daly in this clip we'll see moments from the movie's many action scenes <laughs> The mayor of this pig city has been taken prisoner of war by the People's Revolutionary Strike Force. What do you want? You. Ah! What are you protecting these people for? You know how many they've killed? Sacrifices have to be made, mister. You got the wrong number, boy. We don't deal in violence. What do you deal in? Waiting for all you white hunkies to blow each other up so we can move right on in. You don't give up, do you? Sometimes. 
Not you. Not you, but you are to me, you little man. You're just a maggot who sells dirty pictures. Boy. Like all of the Dirty Harry movies, The Enforcer is bloody and violent, but this time the violence is softened somewhat by the professional relationship between Harry and his partner. She's not a sex object, but a complicated, competent, and interesting person, and Tyne Daly is perfectly convincing in the role. Of the three Dirty Harry movies, Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, and The Enforcer, I think I like this one the best. That's a pretty rash remark, because I think the first one, directed by Don Siegel, Dirty Harry, brought the character out, and that's always very exciting to see the creation of a very strong character. And also, you gave this picture only three stars for liking it so much. How come? Uh, well, three stars is enough. That's not bad. I think that when they made the first Dirty Harry, they didn't realize that in addition to an action movie and a violent movie, they had a lot of humor involved, too. And in this one, I think the balance between the humor and the violence, I hope that doesn't sound too bloodthirsty, but I think the balance is very nice. Roger, Network is probably my favorite film of all the big new Christmas pictures. It's a savage comedy that attacks television with a vengeance that maybe only a newspaper man can enjoy. It's written by Patty Chayefsky. Peter Finch plays a network news anchorman who becomes a hit when he decides to can his good gray manner and starts giving his audience a piece of his slightly loony mind. Ladies and gentlemen, the Network News Hour with Howard Beal. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change. How many stations is this going to You've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Are they yelling in Atlanta, Herb? Are they yelling in Atlanta, Ted? I'm mad as hell. That was a really risky, creative scene to do. Very funny. And Howard Beale, the anchorman, turns out to be a big hit. And that creates a strange relationship between his news boss, played by William Holden, who doesn't think Howard Beale belongs on TV, and Faye Dunaway as an ambitious member of the network's programming department who does. She'll do anything, even seduce Bill Holden to get her way. And here are two scenes from the beginning and near the end of their relationship. Do you have a favorite restaurant? I eat anything. Son of a gun, I got a feeling I'm being made. You are. Well, I've got to warn you, I, I don't do anything on my first date. We'll see. You know, you could help me out with Howard if you wanted to. He listens to you, you're his best friend. I'm tired of all this hysteria about Howard Deal. Every time you come back from seeing somebody in your family, you come back in one of these morbid middle-aged moods. I'm tired of finding you on that stupid telephone every time I turn around. I'm tired of being an accessory in your life. And I'm tired of pretending to write this dumb book about my maverick days and the great early years of television. Every stupid executive fired from a network in the last 20 years has written this dumb book about the great early years of television. And nobody wants a dumb, damn, stupid book about the early days of television. Terrific, Mac, terrific. Maybe you can start a whole new career as an actor. It's the truth. After living with you for six months, I'm turning into one of your scripts. Well, this is not a script, Diana. There's some real, actual life going on here. I went to visit my wife today because she's in a state of depression. And I feel lousy about that. I feel lousy about the pain that I've caused my wife and my kids. I feel guilty and conscience stricken and all of those things that you think sentimental, but which my generation calls simple human decency. You're dealing with a man that has primal doubts, Diana. And you've got to cope with it. I'm not some guy discussing male menopause on the Barbara Walters show. I'm the man that you presumably love. What exactly is it you want me to do? 
I just want you to love me. I think the writing there is a little too clever. It is overwritten, and that doesn't make their relationship very believable. I also think that Holden is much too smart to have fallen in love with Dunaway in the first place. Network gets a little preachy at the end, and despite all that's faults, though, it's the first hour of that picture that's really something special. It's a wild and uproariously funny put down of everything that everybody has always thought is wrong with the television business, namely, that it's more interested in profits than public service. One last point, don't get the idea that this picture is good simply because it puts TV down. It's the way it puts it down, with fine performances and some very funny and foul mouth writing. Gene, I agree and disagree. I agree in the first place that it's, along with you, I agree it's my favorite Christmas movie. I also think Rocky comes in very close second. I disagree that it's overwritten. I think that one of the nice things about the movie is that it's written. Patty Shiesky's screenplay is intelligent, it's lucid, it's witty, uh, it's sarcastic. Uh, there might be occasions when we're too uh, aware of the dialogue, but on the other hand, how many movies have you seen recently in which the dialogue was totally forgettable the moment you left the theater? You're right there, and so I guess I should point out that my criticism of network is only at the highest level. It's a terrific picture. I mentioned Rocky a moment ago as another one of my favorite Christmas releases, and it is one of the holiday season's most emotionally satisfying movies. It's the story of a down-and-out Philadelphia prizefighter who gets a crack at the heavyweight title. The screenplay was written by a down-and-out New York actor named Sylvester Stallone, who insisted that he play the title role himself. The rest is turning out to be box office history. Stallone is an overnight star, and... Both he and Talia Shire, who plays his girlfriend, are favored for Oscar nominations. In this scene, we see the beginning of the love affair between Rocky and the painfully shy girl down the street. I want to kiss you. You want to kiss me back if you don't want. I want to kiss you. Talia Shire told me that one of the reasons she looked so shy and pale and trembling there was that she had the flu that day. But in any event, the whole movie puts the audience through an emotional ringer because Rocky wants to win more than a fight. He wants to win back his own self-respect. And the girl's fighting, too. She's fighting the shyness that has always kept her hidden away from life. In this series of edited scenes, we see the build-up for the big fight. Do you believe that America is the land of opportunity? Apollo Creed does. And he's going to prove it to the whole world by giving an unknown a shot at the title. And that unknown is you. It's the chance of a lifetime. You can't pass it by. Oh, man. He says to me, you weren't born much of a brain, you know, so uh, you better start using your body, right? So I've become a fighter. Time, kid. Let's go. My mother, she said, said you weren't born much of a body, so you better develop your brain. The electricity is all over the place tonight as Rocky Balboa. You know, I've been coming in for six years, and six years you've been sticking it to me. I want to know how come. You want to know? How about I wait here and you fight? Adrian is a loser. You know, you're looking very great today, you know that? And if you don't watch out, you're going to end up dying alone. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. Our 50 to 1 underdog living a Cinderella story. I think we make a real sharp couple of coconuts. I'm done with your shot. What do you think? Rocky Balboa climbing into the ring now. Is that the world heavyweight champion of you know, three? It really don't matter if I lose this fight. Is he supposed to be George Washington? All I want to do is go to distance. The world heavyweight champion. Seeing that bell rings and I'm still standing. I want the I'm going to know for the first time in my life. Creed. I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. I want you. Hmm. Hmm. A big bunch of arms so they don't work for you. Now you're a big shot fighter on the way up. You don't even throw a clump to your friend Paulie. Hmm. 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 You forget it. You owe me.
Among the other actors you saw, there were Burgess Meredith as the manager and Burt Young as uh, the girlfriend's brother. And all the characters in Rocky inhabit a barren, emotional landscape. Director John Avildsen is very good at isolating them in their dreary existence so that when Rocky's big break comes, it's all the more dramatic. And the movie's ending, a confrontation with a heavyweight champion of the world, is one of the most draining, exhausting, and emotionally fulfilling scenes I've seen in a long time. But the one thing we shouldn't do, Gene, is say who wins the fight. I won't do that, but I'm also not going to agree with you that the picture is all that terrific. I liked it, but not quite as much as you. And what I didn't like was two of those characters. One, the woman, she is so shy and retiring in the beginning of the picture, it's ridiculous. In fact, it makes her turnaround, for me, unbelievable. And even worse is her brother, Paulie, the guy who's screaming, I'm a loser. Uh, it, it's just embarrassing. It's like old kind of the worst method acting. You're bringing too much logic to the movie. It seems to me that it works on an emotional level or it doesn't work at all. If you start thinking about it, it falls apart. But to me, it's got a lot of heart and a lot of spirit. Well, maybe we'll agree on this. I think this is a major disappointment. The film is Peter Bogdanovich's movie starring Burt Reynolds and Ryan O'Neill and his daughter Tatum. It's called Nickelodeon, and it's a would-be sweet comedy set in the early days of silent movie making around 1910 to 1915. Ryan O'Neill plays a lawyer turned fledgling film director who goes out west and finds himself directing amateur actor Burt Reynolds in a goofy silent movie about star-crossed lovers trying to sail a balloon to Africa. Wave farewell then. Give us that confident grin. The world is our oyster. Be natural. That's it. Six feet. New horizons, Dan. All the arrogance of youth. Ergen, I'm going to kill you. That's my smile. I swear I'm going to strangle you. Watch out! What? Help! My God, it's her. Jesus what? Christ. What happened? Where am I? Oh, oh, oh. Grab her, Jack. Oh. Oh. Kathleen, Kathleen! You know her, too? She's cook. Everybody knows her. The problem with this picture is that its characters too often are tied up in ridiculous costumes and burlesque stunts like the one we just saw. Also, you notice how they boosted up that sound every time anybody got near anybody and bumped into each other? I think they're pushing a little hard because they know the picture isn't all that funny. We also never get enough of the characters relating quietly to each other. So, unfortunately, Nickelodeon is a movie about movie making that forgets how important fully developed characters are to a movie. Roger? It's really a, a sad movie in the uh, career of Peter Bogdanovich, who made it. He started out with some good pictures like uh, The Last Picture Show and Paper Moon, but recently he's been making expensive, overblown pictures like it, A Long Last Love, Daisy Miller, and this one. I hope this is not his last picture show, but I wish he'd go back to that kind of film. And now, here comes The Silver Streak. It's a cheerfully entertaining adventure comedy set on a passenger train between Los Angeles and Chicago, and it stars Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor, who team up to solve a murder prevent a fraud, and rescue the girl. In this scene, Wilder's been thrown off the train somewhere in the Southwest. It's one of the many times he gets the heave-ho, and Richard Pryor is trying to help him get back on board. That's my driver's license picture. I hate that picture. Yeah? Why don't you just shuffle right over there and tell him about it? Are they the police? No, they're from Traveler's Eight. But how are we going to get on the train? That's a good question. I still got the gun. Maybe I could start a diversion. Yeah, blow your brains out. Wait, I got an idea. You come with me. How much you want for that radio? Pay it out. We'll take it. Pay the man. What? Pay the man. It's a bad hat you got on. Give me five dollars for it. This is yours. Thank you. Pay the man. What? Pay hey, the man. And another five for the shoe polish. What do we want with shoe polish? Don't argue, just pay the man. Forty dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, see anything else you want, just make me an offer. No, thank you very much. Uh, how about a brush? Nothing! Can't win them all. That is the stupidest idea I have ever heard. You want to save that girl's life? Then it's this or we're dead. Now take off your jacket. Come on. I can't pass for black. Who are you telling me? I didn't say I was going to make you black. I said I was going to get you on the train. Now we got to make them cops think you're black. It'll never work.
That line, uh, nothing, was a wilder ad lib, one of the best in the movie. And the movie's climax is sensational as the Silver Street crashes right into the Union Station lobby headed in the general direction of the Merchandise Mart. Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor make a nice team. Wilder is quiet and sly and Pryor is manic and carefree and the movie finds a nice balance between action and comedy. Again, I don't agree with you. And this time I'm in a rough position because what I don't like about the picture is about its first hour and a half, which is before that scene gets started, where we have a whole mystery about what's going on with a murder plot on the train. And that is very confusing. You don't know where this picture is going until these two guys get together. And then you know where it's going, which is in a pretty funny direction. Certainly that clip is enjoyable. Be that as a may, Gene, it sounds to me like there's a bloodhound in the balcony. And that means it's time for the dog of the month. And my dog this month is a science fiction movie called At the Earth's Core. Doug McClure plays the hero who rides a gigantic steam-powered screw right into the center of the Earth, where everyone keeps walking past the same trees, rocks, and monsters all the time. The trees look like paper mache, the monsters look like Saturday morning cartoons, and Doug McClure looks like he'd rather be in the land that time forgot, or maybe he was, I forget. Roger, my dog of the month will probably qualify as the wolfhound of the winter. It's a Korean-made King Kong rip-off movie called Ape. It's done in 3D, and that means like in every 3D movie, the audience gets a lot of junk thrown in its lap. Bricks, flaming arrows, billiard cues. The whole picture is a crude attempt to rip off a remake. You know, Roger, if they come up with a picture called Son of Ape, then we probably have the first sequel that's a rip-off of a remake, and that would sum up a lot of the filmmaking in 1976. <laughs> it's all, true, true. all too true, Gene. But on the bright side, next month, we'll have film clips and differing opinions, I'm sure, about what were the 10 best movies of 1976. <laughs>